I'm Wendy Valiot. As Betsy said, I work in the Behavioral Medicine Clinic, um, which is located at the Institute of Psychiatry. I just want to say thank you all for having me here today. I will say it's a pleasure to work with Dr. Adams and Dr. Morgan and all of their patients and staff. I think it's a very unique team and that we all understand the ways in which um, suffering from pancreatitis can really affect a variety of outcomes, including how people think, feel, your emotional state, relationships, et cetera. And that's kind of the component I'm going to touch on this evening. So we are a very different type of clinic than you might be used to seeing in the community. We only see patients in the behavioral medicine clinic referred to us from medical specialists. Um, and that's because we really have a good understanding of how dealing with chronic illness such as pancreatitis can really affect your quality of life. Um, so what you can and can't do, I often tell patients, uh, your mind wants to go and your body is betraying you, saying, you know, I want to go play with my grandkids, I want to plant flowers in the garden, but yet you're not able to. And so we have a good training in kind of how to help folks manage these changes in life. I'll usually start my initial intakes with people by saying, um, you know, you're not referred to us because anybody thinks you're crazy. Uh, you're going through something pretty significant and what you're experiencing for the most part is normal. So it's normal to experience low mood and worry following an initial diagnosis of pancreatitis or even the initial symptoms. Frequently, folks go years without even being officially diagnosed with pancreatitis. Um, there's a sense of loss of what you, like I mentioned before, what you can't do anymore and grief over those aspects. Having to adjust to symptoms of the disease, adjusting to the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stress of the variety of treatments that have been described so far this evening. Uh, people will talk a lot about the feeling of losing control. You don't have control over your body anymore and that can be a really scary feeling. Um, and of course there are just the practical issues, so changes in finances that can cause stress in families. Um, and so adjusting to this is a process and like I said it's normal to have some worry and some low mood, but if these reactions last too long, they can end up really having a negative effect on the illness itself as well. Um, so for example, having symptoms of depression, feeling tense, feeling, feeling worried, can exacerbate your already diminished quality of life from the disease itself. Um, and it can make symptoms like the nausea and vomiting worse, make the pain worse, and that can make it very difficult um, sometimes to adhere to medical recommendations from your treatment team. We also know that you don't face the stress, the stress of coping with pancreatitis in a vacuum. It really affects your whole family. Um, we talk a lot to people about the effect it has in regards to the changing roles. Um, you might be a mother who's used to taking care of your children or a father who's used to going to work and providing for the family and then you're dealing with this disease where you might not be able to work anymore and your spouse has to step in and take over in that area and that can be really tough to adjust to those changes. Um, children oftentimes with younger folks that are coping with pancreatitis might not understand what their parent is going through and they are asking, mom why aren't you coming to my play, why aren't you watching my soccer game and don't really understand that physically you're not able to do that because you are too sick. Um, something that comes up pretty frequently that we work with a lot of folks on is communication. So a lot of times there is a mismatch between what you want to say and what you're actually saying to the people that you love, your family members, your spouse, your children. So you might tell them, you know, I just want, I want everyone to go away. I'm having a bad day, I'm in a lot of pain, go away. And what you really might mean is, right now I'm really in need of some comfort. Um, but you might not have the tools to ask that. You might not know how to say, I need help today, or I need a little bit of, 
a little more kindness today than, than other days. Or you really just might want a little time to yourself, but there's often that mismatch between what you say and how it's said, and that lack of communication um, can exacerbate, like I mentioned before, some of the depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms that we see with um, folks who are dealing with pancreatitis. So I thought it was worth kind of defining stress as we talk about pancreatitis and um, all of the components that go along with it. So we define stress as the anxious or threatening feeling that we experience when we interpret or appraise a situation as being more than our psychological resources can adequately handle. I know that's a mouthful, but if you, if you think about it, being diagnosed with pancreatitis, having to cope with the multitude of symptoms that go along with that, and I'll go over that in a minute, the changes of quality of life, decisions regarding surgical procedures, medical treatments, um, it's a lot. And frequently, it feels at times more than we can handle. Um, so you can see where this might increase feelings of hopelessness or helplessness. and obviously create stress. So stress, the stress response is multidimensional in nature. It affects the way we think about ourselves, it affects the way we think about the world, and it affects the way we think about the future. It can also change the way we feel, both emotionally and physically, and thereby affect our behaviors and our actions. So if we break it down into these different components, when our psychological resources become depleted, it can be really difficult to concentrate on simple tasks. And most individuals who have pancreatitis are also prescribed a variety of medications that can exacerbate one's ability to focus. So not only are, you, are your psychological resources depleted, but frequently you're on some <clears throat> significant narcotic medication that might also cloud your ability to think focus, attend, make decisions. Um, I'm going to highlight this negative thoughts component here because this is one of the areas that we work really hard at in our clinic to help people recognize negative thoughts or as we describe it, thinking errors um, and work on altering them and changing them so that they're a little bit more adaptive. So negative thoughts and worries may consume you as you deal with pancreatitis. I'll frequently hear people tell me, I'll never be able to enjoy life again. Um, I'm a burden. This isn't what my husband signed up for when he married me. That's a big one, the feeling of I'm a burden, I'm burdening my parents, I'm burdening my children. Um, and once these thoughts kind of start to cascade, as you can see, it really can affect your mood, which then can turn into increased tension and affects um, some of the symptoms of pancreatitis that we already see, such as pain and nausea. So our goal of therapy then, one of our main goals, is to come up with alternative ways to think about pain and your different experiences. So instead of thinking, I'm in this constant pain, it's never gonna go away, life's never gonna get better when you're having a bad pain day, we'll work on changing that thought pattern, pattern so that you're thinking instead, all right, today the extreme pain is back, but I know it's only temporary. And you can see where thinking of it in that way can result in a very different emotion than thinking of it in this is an absolute, what we call kind of black and white thinking. And I have some handouts there that will highlight some of those thinking patterns as well. So as we can see, oops, there we go. Thoughts can lead to a change in your normal mood state. So you might worry about your future, your family, your ability to tolerate small frustrations might become more difficult. Folks will talk to me a lot about, you know, used to be a pretty calm driver. Now I'm driving and one small thing might happen and I find myself getting really angry. So the ability to cope tends to become more difficult when we're in constant pain.
And as I mentioned, we can kind of put the pieces together here to see how thoughts can affect the emotions, which then might affect a variety of behaviors. So it might be, like I mentioned before, more difficult to follow recommendations regarding abstaining from tobacco, namely. Um, might make it more difficult to follow your, follow your diet, to sleep. Um, you might find yourself having angry outbursts. A big one that I talk to a lot of patients about is avoidance of people and activities. Um, I'll hear people tell me, you know, I never know when I'm going to get sick. So I don't want to make plans with my best friend to go out to dinner because what if I become sick? What if the pain comes and I have to cancel or I have to leave in the middle of dinner? So you really see how these thoughts and the worries can affect what you do. And frequently this is resulted in reduced self-care. So you're not taking care of yourself to the best of your ability because of all of this stress your mind, your emotion, and your body is going through. So this is a, a chart that I thought I would show just briefly to kind of highlight some of the areas we try to focus on in our clinic. Um, I'm going to use that bottom example there since I just spoke to it. Fear. That's a, it's a big emotion with many of the patients I work with, whether it's fear of surgical procedures, fear of um, social contact, going out, even going grocery shopping, fear of an attack coming. Um, so that's the spontaneous reaction or what we call the automatic reaction is to avoid. You know, the only way I can stop the fear is to isolate, to be by myself. Um, and that is adaptive because then you're not out in public. You're not having a pain attack while you're in the grocery store or having to leave dinner with friends because you can't concentrate due to your pain. However, it isolates, and that can create, like I mentioned before, more symptoms of depression, loneliness, hopelessness, um, and result in what we consider a phobia um, because that fear is being reinforced by isolating. So we'll work on focusing and recognizing what your automatic reaction is, identifying what the cognitive distortion is behind that reaction, and starting to challenge some of that and work on overcoming those fears based on what your values are. If your value is your family and your friendships and being able to improve your quality of life, then there are certain strategies we can work on in therapy that will help you reach those values and ultimately improve your overall confidence in terms of socializing. So. Pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, obviously can be considered a, a chronic illness and is often a turning point in an individual's life, as I think I've established. Um, it disrupts personal social functioning, um, and the ultimate goal of our work is to find new ways of coping with your altered circumstances to kind of restore that balance. So in thinking about the patients I see, along with some, some research, you know, these are unfortunately only a few, but probably the most common unique factors to folks who are dealing with chronic pancreatitis. We see the physical symptoms of nausea, vomiting, both the chronic pain and those acute episodes. Um, many folks are dealing with diabetes, checking your blood sugar. Um, a lot of people really have a a hard time sleeping, and we know sleep affects all aspects of life, including mood, fatigue. Um, there are side effects of medication. Um, and there's a stigma around pancreatitis in general that has been touched on some this evening as far as this is an alcoholic disease, or I've had a handful of patients that I've, that I've seen who've come to me and said, you know, when I finally went to Dr. Adams and Dr. Morgan, they were able to give me a name with what, for what was wrong. I've been told for so many years this is in my head, or um, I've been misdiagnosed year after year. Um, and that obviously takes a toll on your mood and, and, your, and your functioning. So not surprisingly, <clears throat> 
about 20 to 50 percent of patients with pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis, report some symptoms of depression. Uh, as I've mentioned, fatigue, decrease in your ability to be mobile, a change in your activities of daily living, having to stop work, that's a huge one for individuals who have pancreatitis, having to kind of shift your identity from um, a teacher to someone who's disabled and what that means to you can really cause symptoms of depression. As I've mentioned before as well, this idea of social isolation, that no one can understand what you're going through, and a real loss of independence. You know, I'll, I'll hear people very often saying, I feel useless. Um, I can't help around the house. I can't even pick up after myself. I can't wash the dishes. I'm such a burden on my family. As I've mentioned before, worry and tension also tends to, to coincide with pancreatitis. And this is something I'm going to highlight, that it's really important that anxiety remain in control and proportionate to the seriousness of your situation, because a disproportionate mental reaction can cause increased symptoms of pain as well as nausea and sometimes vomiting. So here we're going back to the thinking errors. Um, the pain will never end. I will become progressively more disabled and dependent on others. People won't believe me how bad my pain is. And so when we're thinking these thoughts, they're often accompanied by rapid, shallow breathing. And this type of breathing can occur even without you being aware of it. It's, it's an automatic response. And it can lead then to increased muscle tension, which as we know, increases pain and the other symptoms we've mentioned. So that brings us to the physiological component to the stress response. You're okay in time. Most of you have probably heard of the fight or flight response, so I'm going to review this relatively, relatively quickly. Um, but it's a really important component to how we help people cope with pancreatitis and their pain specifically. So in days of the caveman, right, I'm going to take you back a few years, the fight or flight response was key to their survival. So when they were facing a big threatening tiger, like the one Betsy or Dr. Morgan had on the pancreas up there, um, they had two choices. They could fight the tiger or he or she could run away. Either way, your body, his or her body, is really preparing to respond. Um, so the heart begins to race, the, bre the breathing increases, pupils dilate, muscles become tense, and, your and his mind starts processing information really quickly so they can make important decisions. Um, and this is the natural response to danger. And this helped the caveman survive and thankfully evolve. Um, so specifically, what we're talking about here is the sympathetic nervous system, or an activating system, that kicks into gear when we're in threatening situations, such as being attacked by a bear, or more commonly, doing public speaking, or driving, even, in a very getting caught in traffic type situation. So during this reaction, certain hormones are released. Um, adrenaline's released, cortisol's released, and this helps all those processes I talked about before, so it speeds speeds up the heart rate, slows digestion, shunts the blood flow to the major muscle group so you can either run or fight if you need to, um, and a variety of other anatomic um, functions, giving your body that burst of energy. So what happens when we're talking about chronic pain is your body knows something's wrong, and so it goes into this fight or flight response. However, the danger doesn't go away. Right? The pain doesn't really go away. So your body is in this kind of constant state of arousal. And so what we try to do is help folks calm that system down. So as you can see, not only pain, but anxiety, symptoms of depression, worry, tension, also act on that same sympathetic nervous system, giving yourself that burst. Because your body knows something's wrong, and it's trying to, to fight or flight. When the danger doesn't go away, we become tired, we become aggravated, etc. 
So how do we cope? We, were, we work on, as I mentioned before, recognizing the thought distortions, the thinking errors, and then starting to challenge them, really building back that sense of personal control that frequently tends to be lost with this illness. Um, we work on helping folks change some of their health habits. Um, so quitting smoking is a big one. Smoking can increase pain. So we help people try to get to a place where they're ready and able to quit smoking, following their dietary recommendations that we'll go over shortly. Pacing your activities. Another common thing that we'll hear is, I'm having a really bad day. All I want to do is lay on the couch. Well, what do we know about that? You lay on the couch all day, you're still going to be tense, your mind's going to be focused on the pain. We need to get you up, moving a little bit, distract yourself from the pain. Touched on social support, and a big one I'm going to talk about, and I think um, Jane will be a nice segue into highlighting some of this as well, is relaxation. So relaxation is important for a number of factors. As I mentioned before, it reduces physiological arousal. So when we can slow our heart rate down, when we can start to control our breathing, um, we can activate what's called the parasympathetic nervous system, or the calming system. And this allows our body to rest and digest. By learning structured relaxation skills, um, and using them on a regular basis, we can really begin to activate this system. And that takes the edge of the pain, some of the pain away. I always tell, tell my patients up front, you know, my goal is not to take away all of your pain. I don't think I can do that. But I, can, I think I can help you think about your pain differently and reduce some of your pain experience. So the research will show that... <clears throat> If you can engage and practice some of these activities on a regular basis, you might reduce your pain up to 30%. That's without medical intervention. And many patients will say, I'm, I'll take that plus some surgical procedures or medical intervention and really begin to see an improvement in your quality of life. I also warn patients as well that this takes practice. So if you're planning to run a marathon, you're not going to go running on Monday and plan to be successful in running 26 miles the next day, right? So just like running a marathon, this takes time, patience, and practice. Um, these are some of the relaxation techniques that we use. So we help people learn how to breathe. That sounds kind of weird, right? We're all sitting here breathing, but most of us um, tend to take relatively shallow breaths. I can tell even right now, I'm taking pretty shallow breaths as I'm speaking and giving this presentation. Um, and again, that's a signal to that sympathetic nervous system, which starts kicking into gear and can create muscle tension and increase pain. So we'll work on breathing. We'll, we'll work on something called progressive muscle relaxation, which is a strategy to learn when you're tense versus when you're relaxed. Because frequently, I know I'm guilty of it, I can go all day and, and be really tense and it's such a normal feeling for me that I don't even know it. So learning how to relax and um, feel a difference between tension and relaxation is something we'll focus on. And we can do all of these activities while using what we call biofeedback. And this is a means of bodily self-monitoring. So. We help people learn to control certain physiological processes like heart rate, like skin temperature, and like muscle tension. We'll hook you up to the machine. Typically, I either do heart rate or, or skin temperature and have you look at um, a diagram in which it'll show your body temperature rising or lowering. If your temperature goes up, it means you start to become more relaxed and hopefully you notice a difference in your pain. If it goes down, it's a signal that you may um, be pretty tense or in a lot of pain. So with practice, you can learn on your own how to kind of monitor those bodily sensations using these techniques listed above. So why does any of this matter? I think probably it's self-explanatory. We want to help 
our ultimate goal in the behavioral medicine clinic is to help improve your quality of life. Um, you know, we know that it's difficult to cope with physical ailments when you're also dealing with major depression, major anxiety, or other mental health concerns. Um, there's an increase in mortality when these issues are not addressed. It also affects a lot of your, your physical health. So we'll, we'll see high blood pressure when people have uncontrolled anxiety or depression, a weakened immune system, um, as I mentioned before, increased pain, more hospital readmissions, which I know is one of the ultimate goals is staying out of the hospital, and other increased symptoms of pancreatitis. Well, I don't have a dragon <laughs> or a tiger, um, but the important points I'm, I guess I'm trying to drive home is that stress is multidimensional in nature. It affects your physical health, and the way you think about stress and or pain affects how you experience it. <laughs>